Okay, maybe um, we should start. So welcome everyone to Outing the Past, hosted by the Museum of Free Dairy. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank all of our speakers today for their presentations. Um, and, you know, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Richard. Richard. Thank you, um, Kira, and the Museum of Free Dairy for hosting a uh, very informative and moving um, out in the past festival um, at Derry. And um, I hope that most of you had had the opportunity to um, watch the recordings, which were going up from uh, 12 noon. By the way, I should say this. Um, session has also been recorded and uh, if for some reason you don't want to be visible you can turn off your video or even uh, rename yourself but um, I think it's been very valuable to, to have these sessions recorded um, because it does increase the range of people who can um, view the sessions and um, learn more about LGBT history as I found I was doing myself today even with those speakers that I'm familiar with so I will not assume that you've heard the um, earlier um, recordings and you can also, of course, listen to them um, later on the, uh, the uh, YouTube of the Museum of Free Dairy or um, I've also posted them on the social media of our LGBT Heritage Project. But um, I'll turn to the speakers in the order that they appeared in the recordings and um, each of them uh, might just say who they are in a, in a sentence or two and then just give us a little bit about what the presentation uh, was about and uh, um, I'll start off with Dr. Jeff Evans who presented on the Queer Cayley at the Marty for Sight. Thank you Richard and thank you to the Museum of Free Derrick for creating this opportunity. Um, as Richard mentioned, my talk entitled Queer Curly at the Marty Forsyth was a presentation based on original testimony and archival documents, evidencing and providing a commentary of the first LG, well, it was lesbian and gay, what we would call LGBT conference in Ireland at Queen's University Belfast on the weekend of 22, 23 of October, 1983, all those years ago, as my students say. And it was a juxtaposition between a community reception we had from Ian Paisley Sables from Sodomy on the eve of conference, and more particularly about an invitation from the community, Turf Lodge community in West Belfast to their Curley on this Sunday night. And the presentation really just detailed what was for many of us a remarkable event, which has now been turned by the magic of Dominic Montague and Kvash Theatre into an extraordinary piece of theatre. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Jeff. And um, it's wonderful to have um, a historian who's recording event as a historian, but also was personally part of that event. And maybe that's something that we might uh, Come back to in the, in the in the in the questions, followed by another academic and archaeologist, Brian Lacey. Brian, um, I've heard you speak before, and yet any time I hear you speak, I learn new things, fascinating material. Tell us a bit more about it. I'm going to have to find another topic. This is getting <laughs> out of too much. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, I'm Brian Lacey. Um, Apart from anything else, I suspect I'm the oldest person in this, uh, in this uh, uh, group and uh, maybe I remember the past more than uh, anything else. But um, I, as Richard said, I, I first, well, I just, before that, I just want to thank Richard and, of course, um, the Museum of Free Dairy and Kira especially, and Adrian, of course, but maybe Kira especially for the assistance with the technical stuff, which I still don't understand. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, I'm Brian Lacey. I, I, I was born about 1949, so I was in my kind of 20s when the kind of gay liberation all started. And, um, uh, I, and I was interested, it probably sounds bad, but I, you know, at that time, the only models we were getting were kind of American and British gay. 
And I didn't want to be either. I wanted to be an Irish gay person. So I kind of always interested in looking at the historical background to that. And given, you know, Ireland in, in the six, 50s and 60s when I was growing up, sex, sex, sex of any kind was, was out, virtually outlawed. And, um, but anyway, I started poking around and gradually collected bits and pieces that formed um, into ways. And of course, there was no written history of homosexuality. There was no mention of it at all. But I quickly learned that, in fact, that was not true at all. There was, there's a quite a, an elaborate history um, uh, to homosexuality, to queerness in Ireland. Um, and that they kind of, anti-sex Ireland of the 1950s and 60s I grew up in was in it, itself an aberration and probably only came about in the immediate art of, ar, after, um, after the famine and lasted about a, a century. So sexually repressed Ireland was really from about 1850 to about 1950 and you know and um, and as somebody who was working as a historian I began to find all sorts of bits and pieces and um, that, that's, 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 that's what I was talking about today. Thanks very much, Brian. I'm delighted now to turn to a team of presenters who are volunteers from my own LGBT heritage project. And um, as part of the project, they, they started looking at some archives and followed it through and did some research and put together a presentation on women's news magazine and the Belfast lesbian involvement in the women's uh, movement. And um, uh, they did very well because the four of them had to work, um, you know, collaboratively uh, on Zoom, um, which kind of been the, the easiest thing to do. But um, I'll um, call them in turn. Um, First up, uh, Siobhan. So, yeah, um, I was responsible for the um, first part of the presentation, the introduction, which was a, just wanted to kind of put out an overview of the objectives, uh, the Woman Manifesto um, name, name really for posterity, some of the founders and, um, you know, critical members of the collective over the years, um, and look at a bit of a comparison between early and later editions. Um, and, and just really, really enjoyed um, researching and the whole process, apart from technical recording of it later on, because I am not an academic. <laughs> I should say I'm not used to this a lot. Um, but I had the joy of diving into a big box of actual physical copies of women's news, um, which have just sent me down all sorts of really enjoyable rabbit holes over the last wee while getting this uh, together. So that was my part, the intro. Elizabeth, are you up next? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I took I took the presentation through the idea of grassroots activism, really, particularly focused on a couple of key groups um, involved with women's news in the 1990s. So looking at uh, lesbian line and queer space in particular, and that feeds into uh, my own research uh, as part of a PhD at Queen's. I'm investigating grassroots feminism in Belfast and making a film about it. So I took that on and was mostly um, looking through the online archived women's news editions from the 1990s that are held at dividedsociety.com. So it's a linen hall collection, which is a really uh, great digital resource. So yeah, that was my focus. Thanks, Richard. And then we had Nadine. Hi, um, I'm Nadine. I'm uh, part three of four, so I, I look at um, queering the family through women's news. Um, I find that to be a, a really prominent part of the magazine with its strong sort of feminist influences, but also lesbian input as well. Um, sort of the, the idea of the family and the, the difficulties that um, both lesbian and straight women uh, have raising families as, as single mothers. Um, I also sort of look at the idea of um, caring for queer children, um, which is something that becomes much more commonplace in the 1990s. And again, that feeds into my own research, um, the same as Elspeth. I, I do a PhD in gay activism in Belfast, and um, that involves looking at a very expanded definition of activism. So I look at gay rights, but I also look at sort of service provision, which um, 
often covers queer families. Um, and likewise, I, I use um, editions of women's news that could be found in the Divided Society archive, which has been so invaluable um, during lockdown. You're on mute, Richard. Amy, um, if you'd like to uh, say a bit about your presentation. Yeah, um, it's really nice to be here. Um, and it's much sunnier where you are, Richard, <laughs> than where I am. So just looking at your screen is, is cheering me up. Um, yeah, so my name's Amy. I work in Queen's University. I'm actually bringing a book out, which I'm taking this opportunity to plug. <laughs> on um, Irish lesbian writers. Um, so yeah, I'm a volunteer on the LGBT Heritage Project alongside my other volunteers here today. Um, and I was talking about women's news involvement in the run up to the first Pride in 1991. I was also talking about some instances of discrimination that uh, women's news faced and how they were aligned with different political groups, um, which was not something they necessarily wanted, uh, you know, to be aligned with. Um, it was just interesting to see how things had changed so much in, you know, women's news and, um, you know, Pride and how Pride has become such a big celebration. Um, so tracing the history of that has been, been very valuable. Thanks, Amy. And, uh, um, you did a great job uh, putting together some new material because, as has been noted by some other um, presenters, um, the history of lesbian and bi women, for various reasons, has been missing. So uh, anything that we can do to, 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 to bring that to a wider audience is great. And also, Siobhan, you mentioned that you're not an academic, and I think that's something which, out in the past, as a festival, is very good at, involving people who don't have an academic background, both in terms of being contributors and also as um, as audience, and that was also the case for our um, fourth um, presentation, which was by Brendan Nellis, who isn't an academic and yet had something very valuable about um, LGBT history to, to to share with us, which of course was also um, 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 quite uh, personal to the many people who, uh, who who knew his late brother Tarlock. Brendan. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Uh, yes, this this was <laughs> landed on me by Turlock, who I still miss and love every day and miss him. There are a couple of comrades in arms I can see, Marie, um, who was on that famous night with Jeff and others um, at the Marty Forsyth. And thank you, Dominic, for making such a brilliant uh, play. It's absolutely brilliant. You know, it's a must see. I was walking along the Donegal Beach with Turlock uh, the year before he died while we talked with Jeff. We went over to see, he came over to see the play, the start of the play, and Jeff was coaxing him to do a presentation in Outing the Past. Also coaxing him to get his archives, all the stuff that he kept for years under beds and in people's houses and attics, um, somewhere safe. So, what happened was during those conversations, we agreed, he agreed that he would bring his archival stuff in the boot of my car to see Adrian um, in the Free Dairy Museum, where it is now. When Turlock died on the 1st of April, it was tragic and it continues to be tragic. But I realized with Jeff's prompting that his story needed to be told. Um, there's much, much more in his story in a 20 minutes and day. I got some support then from Richard in terms of trying to crystallise thoughts. And me and Tricia, my wife, sat down and thought, how are we going to, in our own home, without all the skills that are needed to do social media, put something that will portray my beautiful brother, Turlock. And what was helpful was picking a few salient points of contact and interest. So that's what I did. So without getting in, if you watched the, uh, the presentation, I chose 
his early days through his teen and his activism, his growth in activism within Belfast with and then on into New York and then back to Pride, uh, back to Belfast. Um, yeah, we miss him every day and uh, he had a big family. He brought so much to all of us and he really brought the LGBT issues into our family and our community in such a sensitive, brave, courageous way. He never shirked. He was never uh, known anything. He was anti everything. And the difference between being anti and non, like being non sectarian, is oh, yeah, I'm, I don't. But being anti-sectarian is you challenge it. Turlock challenged everything. He challenged me. He challenged my family. He challenged mommy and daddy. He challenged the world and he was, yeah, he'd be missed. That's all I want to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Um, before I put it out to the wider audience, um, and if you have a question, you can either put it into the chat um or um raise your hand but first i'd just like to give the presenters who haven't had a chance to to meet each other today and don't even know all each other anyhow if they have any um questions that are raised by um by any of the other um uh talks that they that they saw I just want to say thank you because I really enjoyed everybody's presentations and that yeah it was a really broad range of topics so it was brilliant um and Brian I was wondering in particular about about yours if you had you sort of mentioned you started as as through your own interest as a historian but were, was there any starting point to wanting to investigate that particular queer Irishness because I found through the language that side of things was really fascinating um well, yeah, yeah. As I say, I mean, I, I, I was born in forty nine, so nineteen forty nine. So, um, I kind of grew up, and I was just kind of, um, wouldn't have known anything like about being gay or like say, except knowing that I was slightly different. And then uh, by the end of the sixties, um, with gay liberation, particularly in America and then in in, in England. We were becoming aware of what what the, the topic was, and as I say, I I, I don't want to self make it sounds as if I'm anti American, anti British. I just that I was curious as was there was was, was this a, was there were there other people in Ireland? Was there a history of it? In Ireland? David Norris, Senator David Norris, famously said that at one stage, you know, it was as if the terms Irish and homosexual were mutually exclusive. And um, but I, I then realised that we had a very peculiar sexual history on this island, north, south, and every way. And the famine was the real uh, change, game changer, in that the famine came about because the, basically, if you're like all the social, political, economic side, but but in terms of human experience, there were just there were just so many people, and. How do you reduce the population after that trauma in a society that doesn't have contraceptive? And one of the ways they did it, and the, all the churches, not, not the Catholic Church particularly, all the churches were engaged basically in eliminating sex from our lives in all its respects. And um, so we had this century or so from about 1850, as I say, to 1950, 1960, when things begin to change. And um, and of course the, that that coincided with the emergence of gay liberation and movements and Stonewall and all of those kinds of things. So all of that would have whetted my appetite. And then as as a kind of a, st a student at university, I began to find the texts, which to my knowledge no one else had ever kind of put together. And um, I'm, I'm sure like a lot of the academics, <laughs> you end up writing things, not because you want to, because nobody else has done it. So you feel you have to do it. <laughs> and I wish somebody else would write these books or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, um, as they haven't, I, I throw my own hat into the ring. Anyway, that's... that's yeah. I'm so glad that you have, Brian, and continue to share that uh, knowledge. Um, anyone else, just raise your hand or speak if you have a, a question for any of the other presenters. Can I ask a question, Richard? 
far away, Amy, and then Brendan. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I enjoyed everyone's presentation. So thank you very much to everybody. But um, my question is for Brian again. Um, so I, I read your part of your book, which I really enjoyed. So thank you, first of all, for writing the, the, your book. Um, I've heard a lot said about St. Bridget and her sort of lesbian history, and I don't know a lot about it. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how Bridget got this reputation, because I'm sitting here with my St. Bridget's cross looking at me right now, so it seems appropriate. Well, the first thing to say is we don't know whether Bridget existed or not as a real historical person. You know, she's a mixture of a goddess as well as, as a, a, in fact, the historical evidence is very slight, to say the least. In the story, she has this favourite nun, um, Darludica, and, Dar, and she sleeps with her. Now, again, I, I think I pointed out in my talk that just because people slept together, in the Middle Ages and that was earlier on, doesn't mean that they were ne necessarily having sex. People did it for warmth and comfort and all the rest of it. Um, uh, and I, I really don't know. I, I, I have to say that there's no evidence that's, that the character of Bridget, whether that's a fictional character or, the, or a real historical person, was lesbian. Um, but one has to say if that if that you know if you discovered that sister so and so down the road was sleeping with one of the younger nuns today you'd certainly query it if nothing else and um, and certainly the point you know, you know these the, those kind of early saints and things like, I mean they're archetypes they're not you know we I spend an awful lot of my time deconstructing them in order to get the real historical people behind them but. In, the, in terms of what we know about them, they're archetypes. And, um, but what we do know is that lesbianism, ex, ex, of course, it existed in early Ireland. And although we have much less evidence for it than we have for male homosexuality, as is the case in other European societies and so on, um, nevertheless, the, the, when it appears, it appears as a normal thing. It doesn't appear as an odd thing. It appears as a perfectly normal thing that just, as it were, gets mentioned in passing rather than as some great scandal or other, you know. So that's about the best answer I can give about St. Bridget. That's Thanks, great. Brian. Brendan, you want to say something? Yeah, well, mine, mine was to Brian as well, and it's on a similar vein, but it was, it was about, I was really intrigued when you mentioned about St. Patrick and also obviously legendary Kit Coo Holland, but two, one real person, one mythological legend, both had hints of gayness. And um, I just wondered, it really fascinated me on the, on the verge of St. Patrick's Day coming up. Wouldn't it be great if we had another gay hero who is St. Patrick? But can you expand a wee bit? Well, back to Tarlock again. I mean, the struggle to march in the St. Patrick's Day parade by gays was just so ironic given that the very first text in our history by St. Patrick, by the real historic, actually mentions homosexuality. You know, it's just kind of ironic that the ancient order of Hibernians, I'm sure they must have choked if they ever discovered the fact. Um, but um, uh, again, these, you know, what we, what we know about all these characters, and again, as you po rightly point out, Patrick was a real historical person, no doubt about it. Cuchulain is a is a fictional character, uh, uh, and there are there are archetypes. And Cuchulain, I mean, there's no there's no evidence whatsoever that Cuchulain either fictionally, you know, uh, was engaged in gay sex. But but the point was that they were they they were he was a foster brother of the character Ferdia, and they though and all through our Gaelic Gaelic culture. Foster brothers exhibit strong love relationships. Now, whether that was in any way physical or sexual, who knows? But that they ex are unrestrained in their in their statements of love for each other, and that and that's um, and and, and Cuh the, the stories about Cuchulain exemplify that. But it's also, of course, recorded in places like the law tracts, which are you know uh, the um, the, 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 
in the real historical law tracks. That, that, that explains. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you. That explains a bit more. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Brian and Brendan. Um, if anyone uh, um, just wants to um, ask a question, just either raise your hand or put it in the, in the chat and uh, I'll keep an eye out for you. Um, Richard, we actually have a question from Kenneth and this is for Nadine. So Nadine, could you say more about broadening, broadening out the definition of activism? What are the particular boundaries you would draw? Um, I think that the definition of activism is quite subjective. Um, so you can have a very narrow view of activism that really just looks at sort of gay rights discourse. But for me, activism is anything that asserts identity in an otherwise oppressive society. Um, that is sort of what I take to be my definition of activism. And that's something that I sort of carry through in my research. So for me, it's social activism through service provisions like Care Friend. There's cultural activism through magazines like Women's News, which also sort of spills into the social as well. Um, and then you've got your more standard political activism. I hope that sort of answers it a little bit. Thank you, Nadine. <laughs> Kenneth, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Uh, any anyone else? Any other questions? You can raise your hand or or put one in the chat. Can I ask a question of Brendan actually um, about Turlock? Uh, Brendan, wh wh why did did Turlock go to New York in the first place? What you know was was the feeling of oppression or whatever in, uh, at home or what was it? Was it just economic that he was chasing a better life or? Uh... A better gay life. He felt very oppressed here by being a gay man. He, he was always very interesting, Nadine, talking about activism. He was always an activist in all aspects of his life. Um, he was very gregarious, big, loving, life-loving man. He found it very oppressive in Belfast for a lot of reasons. At that time, Belfast was a very cold place for gay men. He went to New York um, and overstayed his welcome as a student, overstayed his welcome. Under well, well, he's not. He can never be caught for this now because he's no longer with us. But he went on a British passport as. Everyone here in this side of the water still knows him as Terry or Terence Nellis. Got to New York and he changes and he went with his Irish passport and he became known and is known as Turlock McNeilish, his Irish name. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I left was because of it was hard to be out and free as he wanted to live his life. Um, and so when he got that in New York, he just loved New York. But Terry always wanted to live at home. He wanted to live in Ireland. He was an Irish man through and through and wanted to be here. Even him and Juan, his husband, now I were thinking about if he had been able to live another few years of retiring about his age 60 and possibly retiring to Belfast or to Ireland, probably around uh, Newcastle County Down where other family members live. So that was his reason it was it was he wanted to be he wanted to be free and yeah. live his life without a price well le le less of a price than he would get although we received that in new york as well but new york is a much freer society and was then and still is well i mean i lived in those years in Derry, and almost every young gay person in Derry went to london yeah so, you know, he know, went to london stuff. first he went to London first, but he, he then went over to New York. Yeah. Jeff, you wanted to come in? Yeah, he also fell in love. Jeff, you had a question? You yeah, that? no, I'm just saying, Brendan, he also, and Brendan knows, he also fell in love. Love was one of the reasons as well. But one of many uh, telex strengths was his capacity to love. Yeah. And uh, I remember. Uh, you, all you heard was about his love interest for the last six months he was in Belfast 
which was lovely to hear. But after you've heard the telling about six times, it's you know it's just a just a bit too much. But it was lovely to hear. It was lovely to hear. Uh, uh, Brendan, you mentioned something there, which is a, a distinctive feature of Irish LGBT history. Um, that some of the persons use more than one form of the name. One of them, Tarlock's um, was collaborators, uh, would have been known originally as Charles Carrigan, who later became Cahal O'Kirigan, and now is better known as Cahal Carrigan. And even some his gay historians of, of gay history have taken a while to realize that this is the same person um, uh, and the same could happen to um, uh, to, to, to Tarlac. So it's, it's one to watch out for if you're, if you're, if you're searching someone especially to come from um, um, a nationalist or Republican background, they may have more than one name in their long lives of activism. <laughs> It's like Derry in London, Derry. <laughs> uh, Marie, you've got a question? All right. No, it's not so much questions, more contribution. Seeing as how my life was kind of flashing before me in all of those presentations, except Brian's. Haven't lived that long, Brian. Not medieval yet. Um, but Brandon, I just wanted to say to you, you did the big man proud. It was brilliant. I really was very moved by it. But I, I know it's coming up to his anniversary, so I've been feeling it anyway. But it's been, uh, it's been difficult. Uh, and I know it's been extremely difficult for you, all of you in the family. But um, I was reminded when we're saying about when people went away and I went to London at one stage and, and this would have been in the early, it would have during the first hunger strike. And... Um, <laughs> Tarlock came over and uh, he was uh, he was involved with a there was an event there was a, a, a fast that was done on the steps of the old GLC in London in support of the hunger strikers and he insisted on doing it and he was staying with me and uh, so he was literally on this kind of hunger strike for like three days and three nights on the steps of the GLC anyway he came back on the Monday morning and he was starving and um, and I said to him Tarlock because you haven't eaten anything for three days, three nights, your stomach's going to shrunk a bit. So just have some tea and some toast. So I had made tea and toast. I said, and a boiled egg, that's it. No, he insisted on a fry up, which he eventually had. And then he promptly threw it all up down the toilet because it was exactly, it was like, the, it was like that appetite that he had for everything, for life, for activism, for food, for friendship, you know, all of that. That always reminds me, no, no, I have to have it all now. It has to happen now. And that was very much like him. He was everything had to happen now, because and if it wasn't, he was going to make it happen. And mm -hmm. and Tarlac and myself and, and Fergus shared, shared a house together on the on the Falls Road yeah, back yeah, in the early eighties yeah. as well. Remember, the first gay the commune in West Belfast. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it was just I mean, apart from the the bottles of wine that got sunk, it was also like was constant conversation. It was constant planning and plotting and conspiracies and, 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 and strategies for activism. And that was on a number of fronts. It was on, I mean, obviously for me, I also had the, the women's movement as well. And so, so we were all, and, and, and uh, Fergus was people's democracy at that stage as well. So we were all involved in, in kind of left wing social justice, um, radical politics. And then um, we both, and all three of us shared our, our, our queer politics as well. And so it was a really important time for all of us. I don't think at the time any of us knew that. It's when you look back on it, you realize that you were part of something that was the, the birth of something, the birth of the coming together of, in a very open way for the first time, um, what it was like to be Republican, what it was like to be queer, what it was like to be feminist, to be left wing, yeah, to be yeah. socialist, all those things all combined at the one time. And so for me, it's been really important in terms of, I mean, for a long time, I felt that, I mean, the lads had each other in some ways as friends and all the rest of it, but I was always looking for women who had the same kind of background or, or, or kind, of, kind of trajectory or journey that I, I was having. Um, and it was quite a while before I found anybody that did other women that, that had the same politics. But 
Tarlock was such a big part of of that evolution and that development because him and I came from the street away from each other as well. That was the other thing. We grew up two a street away from each other yeah. and we were only two years apart in age. So it was like, it felt very much like we had come out of a, a ghetto and what we were determined to do is not to go into another ghetto and to stay out of the ghetto and make the world as big as we could possibly make it, you know, and bring everybody we needed to, to bring them into that world with us as well. And I think that was, that was what I shared with Darlac. That was the, the the kind of the birth of something. And, you know, it, we all kind of took our different journeys along the way of that. And his took him to, to the States. And um, and I'm just absolutely delighted that thanks to Jeff, um, I actually got to see him again just a year before he died because we were over for out in the past in New York and it was something else just to see him and the big bear hug because um, the big bear was getting even bigger and uh, <laughs> as we all are <laughs> and it was just it was wonderful I'm so glad I had the opportunity so I want to thank Jeff for that as well so thanks very much and Brandon he would have loved that absolutely loved that well done yeah thank you thank you Marie I know he was yeah you were were a magnificent friend and supporter and support supported off him and 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 the rest he learned a lot of that activism that he brought to new york he never because he went to new york he never forgot his roots as i've said in in the in the, in the presentation he was always really fiercely irish and proud and needed and did bring the isms together whatever ism whether it was to do with the republican struggle or it was to do with lgbt or it was to do with disability or it was to do with equal marriage or it was to do with so many things turlock had this amazing ability to bring them together and bring people together that um may not have been together the, the work that he did in new york prior to the 2016 walk in the new york big New York parade with all the inter-fighting groups <laughs> that, 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 that were vying for, I don't know, position or power within it and were arguing with each other. I was there in the wake of this big man just gently cajoling, working with them and bringing them all together so we all walked together down Fifth Avenue on, on that St. Patrick's Day, which and forever after, the Lavender and Green Alliance will walk on St. Patrick's Day and be invited. And Turlock had a big central part to play in that. So his activism sort of was born in the streets of Belfast and born in the house that he shared with you, Marie and, and Fergus. And he didn't lose it. He brought it to America and showed America what activism is really all about. He really did. So, yeah, thank you, Marie. Uh, Jeff, unmute yourself. Bloody technology. Right, okay. Um, what Marie and Brendan have touched on there is the exceptionality of activists, especially queer activists from the North, and exporting their activism around the world, of which Tullock is one of the glowing examples, but one of many. And I think that is an, something that certainly out in the past would like to investigate and showcase more in future years. It's just a general comment on the exceptionality of events like this. And it's not exceptional us because it's part of our everyday life. This is what we're doing now. But within the context of Irish history and Irish politics, this is extremely exceptional. This is exceptional. We're showcasing an aspect of the collective past, which, as Brian not so subtly has made clear, was deliberately marginalised or even ignored. And that's on an institutional level, which we as individuals just find very hard to understand the conceptual power behind um, institutionalised discrimination such as that, the esponging of a history of ho a whole group of people. And out in the past can, and all, um, ev events and certainly efforts like yourself can never undo that, but at least can make sure future generations aren't that ignorant, don't have very singular white, heterosexual, male, etc., etc., elite, in other words, reading of the world. 
and of our history, of our past. And I would encourage everybody, uh, we were putting the invite out for, we started planning next year's out in the past, that's how sad we are. And uh, the invites will be going out during Pride this summer for both organisations to host an event, which hopefully next year, if Boris doesn't fuck things up this end, uh, will be physical as well as virtual. Obviously this year we'll be able to trial a virtual element, which we hope now to combine next year into the physical. And so we are accessible to a much wider audience. But just to plug, if you don't mind, Richard, uh, that in the summer we'll be launching invitations for presentations and invitations to host a hub. Um, there are two hubs, three hubs left, and that is Belfast out in the past on Friday, New York out in the past on Saturday, which is dedicated to Tholuck, and Dublin out in the past is finishing off the two months of the festival with a week-long festival of LGBT history. Um, so they're, they're providing a, a fitting finale to this out in the past 2021. Um, but just again, to emphasize how exceptional your presentations and your contribution and your watching this event is in the course of our lives. Certainly when I was uh, just even 10 years ago, I could never imagine that we would have anything like this. Showcasing the wealth of material that is now being unearthed by people like yourself and being read by people like yourself. It is exceptional. The next is to get that story into the schools so our children don't grow up ignorant and fearful of difference, but embrace the wonderful diversity of our human condition. Um, and that is our ambition. But just to congratulate everyone again, Richard, um, and just, just really take on board how exceptional this is. Just because it's part of our, our, our Saturday doesn't mean it's ex not exceptional to others, it, it really is. And I'm just thinking of all the people who still can't tune in for fear of being identified or being tainted with, uh, with a queer dash of paint. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we'll take in maybe one or two more questions from, from anyone on anything uh, that you've heard today. Um, Richard, we have a question from Dolores, and this is for Elspeth. So uh, Dolores is saying, could you maybe talk a bit about some of the grassroots feminist groups today in Belfast? How does their work build on the groups you spoke of earlier and what additional activities do they offer? Yeah, sure. Um, that's, yeah, I think it's clear from Women's News, as, as we all would have realised doing our research, that um, it really was in its initiation, very grassroots in ethos and uh, many of the people who were contributing spoke of that sense of DIY, you know, not having much money, but really relying on people to contribute in whatever way they could. Um, and that's definitely something that there's many groups currently in Belfast continuing on with. So um, there's such a cross section. The work I've been doing, I've been interviewing people sort of under the subheadings of arts activism, and education and obviously there's a lot of crossover there um, but in Belfast today uh, there's Alliance for Choice who obviously have a faction in Derry as well and have been integral in campaigning um, to get abortion decriminalised as it was back in October 2019 and there's Here and I which is obviously um, a group for lesbian and bisexual women that uh, work still to continue on the kind of um, work that Lesbian Line were doing, the befriending services, providing that for the community. And there's new initiatives of, as well that have actually addressed problems that have just come to light during lockdown. So for instance, we know unfortunately the whole message of stay at home meant a big rise in cases of domestic violence. And so one organization set up was She Sells Sanctuary and they take donations from local artists, whether that's a print or a t-shirt or merchandise from local bands, and they sell that in an online shop and all of the money uh, goes to donations for women's aid and different domestic violence charities across Northern Ireland. 
So that's a brilliant example of something that's only come to light in the last year to address a specific local need, all just done by um, local people trying to help out. And I find it very inspiring to work with so many groups like that in Belfast that are still continuing on those, those activist aims as we talked about. Thank you, Elspeth. I hope that answers your question, Dolores. Um, Richard, do we have time for another question? We do, if you have one. Yeah. Um, so we have one from uh, Maeve, our very own Maeve McLaughlin. And she is saying to the panel, next year is the 50th anniversary uh, Bloody Sunday. Given that this struggle has been about justice and equality, how would we platform outing the past learnings? I think uh, a, a wonderful uh, way of celebrating is what I've just hinted at, that there are a suite of online lessons available for teachers to download on our fantastic LGBT history. It's a project we certainly developed over the last 20 years in England and has been very, very successful. It's not that teachers don't necessarily don't want to teach LGBT history. As Brian will tell you, there's not many courses in Ireland, undergraduate courses, that teach LGBT history. Um, and therefore, the people who graduate and become history teachers will have very little background on the methodology, the historiography of queer history, let alone the, where the primary sources are, all the time to develop lessons. Actually providing easy to go, downloadable lessons is a very easy win to get that human rights message through to schools and i think a lovely way and a very practical and positive way of marking the 50th anniversary of yeah the, the, the struggle year museum has stood by and the human rights you have advocated and upheld would be to make sure that those lessons were created and available to any and all teachers who wanted to educate students about Ireland's LGBT past. That's, that's my contribution to the answer. Could, could I contribute something there? I don't yes, know. please, please, Brian, well, it's, it's for the panel, so anyone that has anything. Well, I, I'm just going to, I mean, the, 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 the March on Bloody Sunday was a civil rights march. And whatever happened subsequently, the, the beginnings of the Troubles and uh, what people now call the Troubles in Northern Ireland began out of a civil rights struggle. And that civil rights struggle was part of an international movement, uh, uh, you know, a shock of electricity that went around the world. It was manifested in various ways in America against the Vietnam War, in South Africa against apartheid, in Central Europe against the communist regimes. And the gay rights movement was part of that international struggle for um, civil rights in the late 60s, uh, early 70s. So there it should be no problem whatsoever about um, uh, seeing uh, the struggle for gay rights or um, queer rights, <laughs> however, LBGT plus rights, um, and align it with the original um, desires of the people who, who uh, were involved in the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Movement, which started, started off in, at the same time. I would like to say something about that. Um, for me, what <coughs> Perlock had a great ability to do was to bring, as I did say before, isms together. Um, and what I mean by that is he learned about activism and about oppression, but that oppression could come from many sources and many people. And I think you're right when you were saying, Brian, about the civil rights movement and, and being a global uh, movement. All these, all these isms, whether to do with Bloody Sunday and what happened in Bloody Sunday or to do with the troubles or to do with oppression of gay people, there is definitely um, a way of 
bringing them together much more closely. Let them become part of what we do so that we all as people are anti-oppression and anti-oppressive practice, if you want, I'm a social worker, so there's some jargon going in there. But what I mean is that one issue can easily and does feed into a lot of other oppressive issues. And we learn in Ireland during the start of the Troubles and through the Troubles, we learn from a lot of other countries about oppression, but also about LGBT issues within that. And that's what Turlock was about. That's all. Right, Brendan, I think we'll, um, we'll wind it up at that. Uh, just to say um, thanks to all the um, presenters. Uh, and um, I know many other people will benefit from watching your um, presentations online. Uh, thanks also to um, Kira and Adrian from the um, uh, Museum Free, Free Dairy for um, hosting uh, today's um, Art in the Past um, and uh, hope to see some of you this Friday at 6.30pm for our Belfast Art in the Past. Um, and um, until then, um, have a good weekend. Amy, hey, see, the sun was out when we started and now it's raining. So that was short lived. Okay. So I didn't even get to enjoy it because it was indoors. <laughs> but hopefully you'll have a bit of sunshine wherever you are. And uh, take care. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all our presenters. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.